Welcome in to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Rapa. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. Each week on The Checklist, we take off five items meant to make your online life safer. Sometimes we're securing new hardware. Sometimes we're securing old hardware that's about to be new to someone else. And sometimes we're just looking at ways to be more security savvy in our behaviors. Now, I don't want to alarm anyone, but I know you have to have heard about the uh, latest virus that's going around your favorite social network and mine. And it comes with bad news, friend. Your computer, it does have a virus, of which you've never heard. But it's okay, because if you just click the link in this unsolicited email uh, from a company with a misspelled name and a slightly discolored logo, they are going to take care of you. Not necessarily in a good way, but they're going to take care of you. Um, is spotting fakes used to be a lot easier than it is today. Internet criminals are getting better at being bad, which is making it harder for you and the people that you care about to figure out what's real and um, what's not. Who's trying to help versus who's trying to take advantage? We're here to help, and we're not taking advantage, you can tell, because we offer no clickable links in any of this audio. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's one way. And also, we're your pals. On today's checklist, five ways to identify and avoid online scams. So we're going to be looking at identifying phishing emails and fake websites. We're going to talk about using a password manager for added security. We're going to talk about tech support, like what's actual tech support versus what's a number that's going to ask for your credit card first thing. Uh, Looking at pop-ups and which ones you shouldn't even bother looking at. And finally, what to do when your browser is locked. It's, um, hmm, what's the best way to put it? It's not exactly a big scary world, except when you start being scared, (laughs) then all of a sudden everything looks sort of, uh, well, everything looks scary. So let's talk about um, some of the things that we can look at and and know, oh, I don't need to be afraid of that because I'm not dumb enough to click on it. I shouldn't say dumb enough. I'm sorry. I have the proper knowledge to not uh, click on that thing. Let's talk about the phishing emails and the fake websites, because this has to be the biggest thing, right? This has to be one of the biggest vulnerabilities for people. Mom, dad, your uncle gets an email that kind of looks official. It certainly sounds scary. And before you know it, they've clicked on something. And now you're getting those emails too. So we've already told everybody in our lives, no matter what, the king of whatever country (laughs) or the prince of whatever country doesn't need to send you millions and millions of dollars to your bank account. No, he does because he he can't move that money himself. He needs you, Nick. You're his only hope. (laughs) Exactly. It's not true. Okay. It's totally not true. Bummer. So now we're going to take a look. We're going to take a look at identifying the phishing emails and fake websites. So over the years, all the automatic detection methods for this has gotten a lot better. So if you're using a major email service provider, chances are these emails are ending up in your junk folders, your trash folders automatically. But every now and then you're gonna see one. You're gonna see one pop up in there. It's gonna say it's from your major banking institution or whatever, other service provider you don't use, or maybe from a bank in another country or hundreds of miles away, you're going to see it and you're going to go, do I use this? No, I don't use this. This is, this is a scam. This is a phishing website. This is, this is a phishing email, fake website, and you're automatically going to delete it. I mean, chances are majority of the emails that come into you like that are going to be fake. Well, here's the thing. I mean, so you get something. I mean, the thing to remember, like, I have known people who have clicked on stuff from institutions, as you say, that they don't even use. I mean, the first thing to remember is, I mean, the scammers are playing a numbers game. They don't know you. They don't know that you actually use or what bank you actually use necessarily. But they're assuming, okay, well, this is a big bank. So I'm going to send this to 100,000 people. If only 2,000 of those people actually use that bank and if only 100 of those people click on that link... I mean, that's still a giant payday for them, or potentially anyway. And you're right. It it totally is a numbers game. So let's say that, all right, you see the email come in from a bank you don't bank with. You're like, oh, that's scam. That's phishing. That's whatever. I'm not going to click it. And then you see one from your bank that you do use, and you click it. You're like, this looks pretty good. They, kn- they know my name. They're calling me Nick. 
Ah. But my name on their account is Nicholas. Right. But my email is nick at mydomainname.com. They're calling me Nick. Those are automatic red flags for you to look at. There's a whole bunch of other red flags to look at as well. Um, First of all, any email that comes in to you, a good rule of thumb is to assume it's not from your bank. It's not from your institution or website or anybody you're dealing with. So if you do want to access them, don't click the links from within the website. Go ahead, bring up your web browser and manually type it in. Go to the sites that you do actually access, type in your your institution name.com and bring it up from there. But I mean, as all these phishing emails get better, as as more and more institutions and websites are hacked, there's more data about you out there. Your first name, your last name, even your birth dates. And then you assume the top five banks, somebody has a bank account with these top banks. So if you call them their first name, last name at this bank, and it looks like their banking email, you're, there's a highly larger chance that you're gonna get them to click the link and you're gonna get them to sign to the website. So you sign in, and what happens? Your login and password didn't work. Automatically, red flags should be shooting up everywhere. Not red flags that you typed your username and password incorrectly, but checking that URL at the top of your web browser going, oh man, did I just get fished? Right, because what you've done is you've given away your username and your password to somebody else who now knows or can assume that you actually do bank with that uh, banking institution for which they've set up the fake site. So the more and more you see the emails out there, you'll start detecting what looks like fake and real. You'll start seeing the mistakes and the grammar mistakes on there. You'll start seeing the logos starting to look a little bit off. Like, maybe the higher quality images are starting to look a little less lower quality. Maybe they're starting to have your email address name in there. Nick is showing up instead of Nicholas. Those are some of the red flags that you could look for when you're, when you're reading the emails. And if they're ever asking for your username or password or for you to verify any sort of data... Like, we need you to verify this, or your account's going to be locked, or any of these type of things. Those are things that, that major institutions don't do for you. When you log into their website, you'll usually see a secure message if it was indeed sent from that institution. You'll see that notification that says, oh, look, we need you to verify this or that. But don't actually rely on just the email itself take a look at the website but don't click the link <laughs> don't click the link in the email to get to the website type it in yourself you know or, or type in the email that uh that's appearing on your your bank credit card or uh, call the number on there is something that's not directly from that email you got since anything in that email is, could be considered suspect exactly I, w- I was gonna say that i mean if you get an email that sort of makes you wonder it don't call the number in that email. I mean, you know that. I mean, you've been banking with your bank for a long time, or your insurance company, or whoever else might be trying to scam something out of you. Um, those places have other places that you can get information. Don't rely on that email because oh, well, they've got an eight hundred number, or oh, well, there's an email link right here, and it says help at Microsoft dot com. Except that's only what it says right there. And when you click on it, it might be going someplace else. It might not even be a clickable link to an email. It might be a clickable link to a website that you didn't even realize it was going to send you to. Exactly. Even when you're highlighting over those links, a lot of times you'll see domain name dot com. And automatically your mind will take you, oh, this is going to domain name dot com. But really, it's going to domainname.com, alternativehostname.com, subdomain name, where you're automatically thinking it is your trusted host. It is the website you're intending to go to, and sometimes it'll even look like it. So automatically, 
just bring up your own web browser. Don't, even if it was a notification from your bank, bring up your web browser. Even if you receive the notification within your app on your phone, bring up your web browser or the app on your phone. Don't specifically rely on the email you received. Or, or here's a crazy idea. Uh, that phone uh, can actually make a phone call as well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're feeling particularly paranoid about online stuff, and I've had those days, um, generally speaking, your bank has either a local number or an 800 number. So yeah. But again, don't use the 800 number in the email because who knows who you're calling at that point. Uh, use a password manager app for added security. Okay. Passwords, it seems to me, are, are fraught with so much peril. It's it's been a long time since one two three four was safe, and I'm starting to feel like four three two one isn't as safe as it used to be either. Uh, and talk to me about uh, password management apps. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, "Oh, how did they know my password? How did they know it was my anniversary date?" These are the type of things that are first guessed, like not necessarily by the random hackers out there, but people who have that data or people who are closest to you or people who could use that data that you supplied on other websites. So it's important to make sure that your passwords are different for every different website. So when one database is hacked, your same password won't be able to be used on another website that you commonly frequent. Basically, uh, password management apps kind of solve a few different problems. The first and a huge issue is that it's hard to remember complex passwords, and it's hard to remember a different complex password for every single website you need to log into. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times people will, you know, use their pet's name followed by one two three or you know date of birth or something like that, and they'll use the same password on every single site. Mm-hmm. So when one of those sites gets hacked and that's happened happens quite often password list gets leaked online and the bad guys figure out what password you're using if you reuse that you know say say your social media account gets hacked but you happen to use that same one password at your bank well guess what the bad guys are now able to access your bank account even though that account didn't get hacked uh so password managers kind of help in a, a number of different ways first they make it really easy to generate a complex, hard-to-guess password. They solve the problem of storing that password for you so you don't have to remember it. You know, you're know, you not writing it down in a text document or on a sticky note to attach to your computer monitor. And, and they additionally have a uh, kind of cool um, feature. Uh, some of them have a cool feature where, where it allows you to autofill a uh, your login details when you go to a site. So you open up your bank's website, you push the keyboard command, and your password manager will automatically fill in your username and password. Uh, the cool thing is the password management app itself checks to make sure that's the legit domain name for your bank, that it's not something pretending to be your bank. It'll check the security certificates. It'll check the domain name. It, it kind of does those things we, we mentioned in the first point earlier uh, about checking the website a link goes to from a, an email you receive. Well, the password managers will go ahead and do that, and they won't autofill the login information if it's not really the legitimate site. Uh, not not all of them have that functionality, but mo- a majority of them do these days, and it's really awesome and makes uh, that aspect of security really easy to do. So there's no real reason not to go that route. Now, we, we're not here to promote any particular uh, password manager or things like that, but can I, am I right in assuming if I went to your website, you would give me a couple that are reputable? I mean, if we go to uh, securemac.com slash checklist, because here's my biggest concern. We're telling people, oh, just get a password manager, and somebody's going to go out, and they're going to get a bad password manager and end up giving access to all of their information. I mean, I haven't heard about it particularly. I haven't heard about a nefarious one, but just because I haven't heard about it doesn't mean it's not out there. There are a number of reputable ones that that uh, we'd recommend using, and they're um, in, available. a lot of them are available in the Mac App Store. Okay. Um, we'll definitely have, have that information listed on the uh, 
the corresponding corresponding document on our site for this episode, for sure. And forgive me, I'm not trying to be cagey and just get you to the website. It's more about, I don't want us to sit here and list three and forget three that would be just as good or that might be even more beneficial depending on what you're trying to do. So when you hear this episode, if you're looking for a, a list of, of uh, password management apps that you might want to check out, uh, the website is securemac.com slash checklist. And uh, don't worry if you missed that, because we'll be giving it again later. Uh, kind of to what I was talking about um, earlier, your bank has a phone number, and you don't need to rely on that fake email for the real phone number. Uh, how do you make sure that the that the technical support, this is item three on the checklist, how do you make sure that the, that the technical support or the support from your institution um, is actually, you know, the number for your institution as opposed to step two of the phishing scam uh, that you nearly fell prey to earlier. So this is a huge one. This is one we're seeing like increase more and more and more. We're hearing stories from, from people contacting us. We're hearing it from everybody else out there. Tech support scam. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you have the right phone number. And so a lot of the times when you're running into issues... You want to contact somebody. You want to talk to somebody. You don't want to wait 24 to 48 hours. You want to have them on the phone, and you want to talk to them right then and there. Mm -hmm. But where's their phone number listed? A lot of the times, the phone number is buried deep within their website because submitting the information to a trouble ticket or email is often easier for the companies. So it's made it so a lot more of these companies are out there targeting people looking for tech support. So you have a lot of tech support scams going on out there. You want to make sure that you have the right phone number. A lot of people are searching for product name, telephone number, or product name, support phone number. And the top listings coming up are not the company names themselves are not the phone numbers for the company names itself. They are third party tech support companies making users feel like they're offering the official tech support for the company. So it's very important that you actually verify who you're calling. We've heard case after case of users who thought that they were calling a specific company, but instead they were calling a support company being charged hundreds of dollars to handle their support issue. Feeling like with the hundreds of dollars that they spent, they were buying support for software, but really they weren't buying support for any of that software. And they were buying support for that call from the third party service who made them feel like they, that they were buying that software. But really, they weren't. They may or may not fix whatever problem the user actually has. Uh, this, this issue kind of is exacerbated by the way search engines show ads and with search results. Uh, for example, before we started recording this episode here, I opened Google real quick and typed in Windows Help Desk Number and searched The first four hits are ads with phone numbers that go to third-party tech support companies that aren't affiliated with Microsoft. And the first real hit also appears to be a third-party one that just got added to Index by Google. It's like 20 hours ago, something like that, which most likely means it won't stay there for very long because it's not real. But right now, it's the first 800 or one of the first 800 numbers that appears on that page. So you're going to have a lot of people who are calling that number, not realizing it's not actually Microsoft that they're calling. And it again, is it's a third party company may or may not be legitimate, will always charge money for their services and may or may not actually fix whatever problem. Whereas the major companies, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, if you have a Kindle device, they'll generally offer to some extent uh, free technical support if you've purchased one of their products. Sometimes It'll cost a bit of money to to fix a problem, especially if it's a hardware problem, something like that. But you've got a guarantee from one of those large legitimate companies that they actually did what they said they were doing when they fixed it. It's not some fly-by-night operation that charges you $400 and didn't really do anything at all. And 
you're out of luck. And you don't have to worry about third-party software installed on your computer, giving full access to your hard drive. Those are some of the things that you have to deal with. So, so to avoid this particular scam, don't just rely on Google search results when you're looking for a help desk number. Go to you know, apple.com and find the support link on the actual company website or same for Microsoft or whatever company you're, you're looking for support for. Don't rely on the search engine to be giving you the correct information because there are a lot of ads that specifically target this uh, particular issue and even even some of the real results won't necessarily be correct. For example, on that so that uh, search I was talking about before, Microsoft doesn't appear until the sixth result in that list for the official Microsoft support site. And a lot of users don't even bother scrolling down that far. They'll click the first, you know, first or second link and they'll get whatever numbers listed there and think they're on the phone with Microsoft. And depending how many people are buying the ad spots, you're going to have to be extra cautious about what you're clicking in the search results. It's actually they it's actually kind of horrifying because yeah, some of us are are savvy enough now to not click on the ones that are ads simply because they're ads. I mean, it's under, I mean, I understand that somebody is trying to make sure that I see their information first and and a part of me is like automatically thinking, well, if they're trying to make sure that I see their information first, that's not the real information I need. So I'll look past the, you know, the advertiser ones. But yeah, then that first one, oh, well, this must be the good one because nobody's paying, um, except I will be very soon if I go ahead and click that thing. Exactly. And then you have to you have to start training your eyes. Yeah. Because you'll start looking for things like your provider support or provider.com. But then you start looking, you'll have to start looking for subdomain names, how they bury the different keywords in there. So... You start noticing, oh, wait, maybe this isn't the actual company I'm looking to click on. Those are some of the things you really want to start looking at because you don't want to click that link and call that phone number thinking that you're calling the actual company. And feel free to ask them. We've tested it a couple times. I've tested it a couple times asking people, are you this company name? Well, I'm not this company name, but I'm offering support for this company name mm-hmm. type deal. Don't be don't be afraid to ask. Well, depending on how scammy the uh, the company is, the the fake fake tech support company, sometimes they're really kind of weasley with it, and they'll they'll phrase it in a way where they're not necessarily Legally. saying they're <laughs> officially elite. Yeah, they'll 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 skirt it, and as you know. And try and make you think you're on the line with the legitimate uh, tech support. You know, they'll say they're certified by whatever company. And that's not the same thing as being a representative of that company itself. Uh, that's just something to be aware of. We've got two more items on the checklist here. Uh, but, and, but I'm going to say it, it seems to me that we could have actually... <laughs> we get, it, don't be afraid to pick up the phone. I mean, it, that may sound crazy, and it's the 21st century, and I know, look, I like not talking to people a lot, okay? If I can do something where I can just read the information and be done, that's fine. But if but if something smells fishy, and step two smells fishy, uh, don't be afraid to actually, you know, like, find, like, the number. A lot of people save boxes. There's probably information that actually has a contact number on there somewhere. Now, you may need a magnifying glass because it's going to be tiny. But, I mean, there are lots of ways to uh, sort of cut just cut to the chase and, and, and get somebody on the phone if that's the thing that's going to make you feel most secure. Because, honestly, what this whole show is about is making sure not only that you are secure, but that you feel secure, too. So, I mean, you can – I mean, there are ways – I don't know. I'm not trying to end the show early. <laughs> I'm not saying don't pay attention to that other stuff. I'm just saying, though, I mean, before you click that next thing, if at any point you feel like I'm not sure, find a safe, reputable way to actually get in touch with the people with whom you need to talk. Yeah, the Microsoft thing. I have a family member that fell prey to the Microsoft thing like five or six times. Um, five or six times. Really, five or six times. Uh, and 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 the problem is, then she got a Mac, and then she fell prey to something else as well. So I mean, I mean, uh, the scams are still out there, and being on a Mac is not going to be the thing that's going to save you, or you know, knowing that you have this one person to take care of things is not going to be the thing to save you. Because I mean, vulnerabilities aren't just about hardware; they're not just about software. 
They're also about, you know, your your level of confidence in what you're doing and, and what you know. And if you come to a place where you don't know, I mean, certainly you can turn to uh, places like securemac.com, email these guys because they know what they're talking about, but they might not be able to help you with like that particular minute. There is also the 800 number probably, or like, I don't know if my bank actually has an 800 number, but I know my bank has a local number. And I know there are three places that I can double check that number and make sure that that's just and you could always you could walk into your branch yeah there's that too you could talk to the folks there yeah you gotta go outside that's the one problem you gotta <laughs> go outside for that one anytime that you're you're talking to people online or dealing with any of your private information just remember if you're dealing with a local company or somebody who has a local branch you can talk to them there locally <laughs> we are starting to sound like three old men here <laughs> Let's talk about uh, – so So here's one that I think probably capitalizes on urgency in a way. Um, yeah, pop-ups. Yeah. You go to a website and something pops up on your screen or, or maybe you didn't even go to a website or you didn't realize you had gone to a different one and something pops up and it's all going to be okay if you just go ahead and click right here. Uh, uh, talk to me about uh, – talk to me about the – I don't want to say dangers because I don't want to scare people, but at the same time, talk to me about the issues inherent in the pop-up. A lot of times when we're dealing with pop-ups, we think about we think about what shows in front of your face. And then we see mm -hmm. the different web browsers talking about how they stop the different pop-ups or different frauds and things like that out there that you commonly see. And they've they're doing a better job the more and more we come along. But the more and more we come along, there's people out there to make money. So there's people figuring out how to make money off of it, how to skirt the ways that the browsers and software and companies are using to stop, to stop this techniques, this, the ways people are trying to target users. And they're getting better at it. And the more the software companies are getting out there better at stopping it, it's a cat and mouse game. One of the one of the things that a lot of a lot of users will experience, a lot of Mac users, because it's getting pretty big, is you know they'll be surfing the web and a pop up shows up saying you've got a virus or your computer's about to crash or you know, something else horrible is about to happen unless you call this one eight hundred number or unless you install this software and they'll kind of you know it appears at random you're not you're surfing the web and you don't expect it. Um, it can be more prevalent on certain types of sites. If you're on a, a torrent search site or you know, sites that let you watch those movies that are still in the theater uh, for free on whatever website streaming, you know, something that's maybe a little less than legitimate, they'll, they tend to appear more often, but they, they, they basically come uh, kind of uh, along, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily matter what site you're on, depending on, on what ads that site's running, you might see some of these scam pop-ups. Um, you should never, ever, ever believe that random pop-up. You know, nothing is going to be telling you. This is if you're not already running security software that you installed yourself. Let me let me rephrase that. Uh, if you're not expecting to see some sort of security pop-up, uh, especially if it's a pop-up telling you to call a 1-800 number, it, ignore that. It's a scam. They're gonna have you call up, and it'll be essentially the the same tech support scam we previously talked about, but they're getting you to call them instead of you searching for a number to call them. Uh, the one exception, uh, you know, if Google has that red page that says this site has been known to distribute malware, they don't want you to click through when you try and click a link, that's legitimate. That's from Google. It's not also not trying to get you to buy anything or call a 1-800 number. Uh, in any event, you can just close the pop-up window or the website and go on with browsing as normal because um, there's nothing actually wrong with your system. There's one thing that um, struck me uh, when you guys were talking a moment ago. The the malware authors are getting better. The security companies are getting better. The the browsers are getting better at spotting these things early. Um, we're kind of the ones that need to get better. <laughs> Which I mean, it's great to rely on all this stuff, but I mean, these are the kinds of steps. Uh, there, I, I hate to say common sense because then anybody who fell prey to one feels like they don't have that. But I mean, these are just the kind of things to be a bit more aware of as we go um, you know, further and further into everything, everything uh, going online. Um, speaking of going online, uh, something that's really helpful for that 
is a browser. Uh, the, the last item on the checklist, what do you do when your browser is locked? So some of those, those pop-ups we were just talking about can be a bit more aggressive and take things a step further. And instead of just saying, your computer is infected, you, know, you better call us before it crashes, they'll try and make you really believe that your computer is infected. They'll do things like take over your entire screen or the, the minute you close the pop-up message, it opens another one right away. Or it starts saying in your computer's voice, like, oh, your computer is about to shut down unless you pay us a lot of money. Uh, anything that can be done to, to stop you from using your web browser, their, their whole tactic is we're not going to let you do anything else with your web browser until you get a hold of us and pay us money to fix the problem, which is the problem they actually caused. There was nothing wrong with your computer. They're just going to stop stopping you from using a browser. Um, so again, never call that 1-800 number or whatever they're, they're telling you to do. Don't download or install or run the scammy security software they're peddling. And don't send them any Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's, it's fake. It's, um, the only exception where it might not be fake is if you're getting pop-ups absolutely all the time, anytime you browse the web, like every time you browse the web, it could be an indicator that you actually have some adware on your system that's causing the pop-ups. But if you're getting these pop-ups kind of randomly, you know, you've been surfing the web all day and it doesn't appear till late afternoon on some site, you know, right if you visit a site, that most likely is one of the, one of the scam pop-ups. The problem is they can kind of do a pretty good job at stopping you from using your web browser. Um, Google, I believe Google was the first one. It might have been, it might have been Mozilla with Firefox. Uh, a checkbox will appear when a pop-up shows up saying, I think it's the second time a pop-up shows up from a site, do not allow this site to show more pop-ups. Safari recently added that feature as well. It's supposedly, it's supposed to stop the site from showing more pop-ups. But again, cat and mouse game, the bad guys have figured out ways around that. It opens up other web pages and other pop-ups. And uh, so you quit your browser and you restart your browser but your browser is set to pick up where you last left off. Oh, man. <laughs> it's I, an endless cycle. <laughs> it, it is. And I've seen the videos of people offering solutions going, what do you do with this? And running through the different scenarios, what you do with this. And because your browser does reopen your last scenario, your last, your last tabs and windows and everything that you had opened, it really is one of those things that keeps on getting you. There are a couple ways, thankfully, that you can get around it without resorting to calling the scammers or paying the scammers or anything else. Uh, one that doesn't always work but sometimes does is uh, you can force quit your browser, turn off you know, your Wi-Fi connection or unplug your Ethernet cable so you don't have an Internet connection temporarily reopen your web browser sometimes you can then close out the offending page because it can't load you know, the data that was making the pop-ups appear uh, otherwise if that doesn't work uh, this this is a way to fix it in safari at least since uh, apple you know is kind of the topic at hand uh, you would quit safari or force quit safari and relaunch safari while pressing the shift key on your keyboard uh, it boots Safari up into safe mode where it closes all the tabs from your last browsing session and it'll stop the alert from appearing because the alert is coming from usually an ad on one of the tabs that's open. Uh, and then some third-party security and privacy tools can also be used to specifically get rid of those files that are used by the browser that are causing it to reopen those those pages and those can give you a clean slate next time you launch your browser as well. Uh, and then your, your browser's unlocked and you can go back to using it. Uh, and then one, one final, uh, I guess, side note on this type of scam is sometimes it's not the message that you'll see isn't one saying you're infected with a virus or your computer's about to crash. They'll say, this is the FBI and you've been doing illegal stuff online. Mm -hmm. And unless you pay us a fine, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have some jail time. And that's fake. Um, the FBI doesn't operate that way. Uh, if you're if you're doing something illegal online, they're not going to show pop up messages to you. They're going to come arrest you. Um, so those those are fake. Uh, those are fake as well and can be safely ignored. They're not going to show up at your door and say, "But for five hundred bucks, we'll look the other way." Exactly. So, so back in the day, 
my parents would never use the internet. Like, occasionally they'd check the email, but as time has gone on, they've found reasons to surf online. They've found reasons for eBay, for doing their purchasing, things like that. One of the best things that you could do if you're one of those people first online or you're one of those people who know that your parents or next next generation is online inform them about these different tactics that people are are going out there targeting them like these are the people who who fall susceptible of this you don't you want to make sure that they're not they're not loading their retirement accounts into whatever prints of some different country out there or trying to log into different websites because they think their their account is going to be logged out because they don't log in provide the proper credentials needed there's this is this is actually sort of a weird episode of this show because generally speaking what we're doing is five things to do and they're kind of like five things to do in order right you're trying to sell something, so here are the five things to do to get that ready. Or you just get a new thing, so here are the five things to do to make sure you're using that more securely. I, I would really encourage not only people who maybe still have some questions about these kinds of things, but if you've got a friend or family member, like like that one that I was talking about who's fallen prey to the Microsoft scam however many times, and I'm not saying anything bad about Microsoft, Microsoft had nothing to do with it, but she's fallen prey to a Microsoft scam like four or five times now. Um, I would encourage I would encourage you to get to know uh, some of these topics a bit more, or maybe direct them to the site for this uh, particular episode. That website again is uh, securemac.com/checklist. That is securemac.com/checklist. I know I said earlier it, it's kind of a it's kind of common sense. Maybe it's not yet, but it can be. And and even though we can't even begin to talk about every single type of scam that's out there. There are commonalities. And so if you get a little bit more comfortable with those, maybe, or or have the, the, the family member or friend about whom you're concerned get more comfortable with those, maybe, then they can move uh, a bit more securely uh, going forward. If there's a particular scam about which you're concerned or another question that you would like to ask or a topic you'd like to hear us cover, uh, we do have an email address that is checklist at securemac.com. Again, that is checklist at securemac.com. And uh, if you have trouble remembering that, just remember, you're listening to The Checklist by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you soon. 